Okay, so this is the second part and hopefully the last part for the basic introduction stuff um, on telecommunications. Now, I said to you the other day or yesterday when we're looking at um, wave propagation and Maxwell's formulas and talked about Maxwell and Hertz and then later on we just got to the end of the class and I was starting to introduce you to Marconi and radio. But I mentioned the sine wave and I said, what's the sine, why is it called a sine wave? Which is something you hear in physics and it's a, you see it on oscilloscopes and such. And this is actually quite a cool little graphic because what it's showing you is that if you look at the green line in relationship to the triangle, there's your hypotenuse, which is the radius. Then if you look at the adjacent, which is the blue line and the opposite, which is the green. Now, if you start thinking about the angle and the ratio between the blue and the green, is the sine relationship. So as the, sine si the size of the opposite gets larger in relationship to the blue getting smaller and vice versa, as the blue gets larger, the other gets smaller. So when the blue is zero, you, or nothing, it's like right down the bottom here, the blue is at the longest, um, the length of the side is at its smallest. So it's basically just a description of the relationship ratio between that opposite and adjacent. So hence a sine wave. But that's not the really cool thing about it because okay, that's a, that's a wave. And Maxwell could work out the formulas for wave propagation and things like that. What that did though, was one of the terms we use is after a, a Frenchman, a French engineer, his name's Ernest Mercady. And he decided that one good name for this wave propagation thing would be to call it radio. Now it's a bit obscure as to why it's called radio because most of the early normal people using this called it wireless because it wasn't connected to a wireless. But he liked the term radio. Radio comes from the Latin for radius. Spokes on a wheel actually is where it comes from. It's over radius was the name. And, and we get things like the radial on the arm, the radius bone from those same, same terms. So because the radius is constant and the other things varied, he liked the idea that the waves would be related to a term called radio. Anyway, so that's, that's just a demonstration of why it's called a sine wave. So we'll get rid of that for the moment because we don't need it. Let me go to back from there and go to the board because we'll need that in a second. Do my little changes to get it to where I like it. And we'll be good to go. Now, we're going to revisit a couple of ideas from previous stuff we've done on electronics. Because without that basic stuff in our heads, radio is not going to make a whole lot of sense. How do you make a machine or how do you make a, um, a, um, a system that can allow you to hear with no wireless, with no radio, uh, way, line in between it? <laughs> I'm trying to think, with no wi a wire in between, a wireless situation. What Maxwell suggested was that a wave could be propagated and the, the um, geometry of that wave could be understood. Um, Heinrich Hertz started to do some experiments on backing up Maxwell's theories and he discovered how he could actually prove that that was the case and he, he's responsible for development of things like terms like frequency and amplitude and stuff. So when we talk about the frequency of a wave, we measure it in Hertz after him. What Marconi did was he realized that this could be used to send things a message over a distance. Now, how do you do a message? One, how do you do a message? Two, how do you actually know how to generate it and receive it? So we're going to go back to some basic electronics or basic electrics. If I have a wire and I connect a current to it, a battery of some sort, and I have a switch if I like, and I turn the switch on and off somewhere in the system, so there's a switch here somewhere, I can get a telegraph to pass through that. I can get information. It's ons and offs, ons and offs, ons and offs. And what will happen is, as I do that, I can generate a current in the wire. That wire will then generate a field around it, and that field radiates out. If I turn it off and on, I can get it to pulse out. Now, that's not much. That's not really useful unless you've got some way of fixing it up. And the first of the terms that was used for this to do it was induction. They started to talk about, before they thought of it as radio and wireless and other things, the experimenters were calling this induction because they realized if you brought two wires close to each other and you brought a, a put a current through one, you got a current induced in the other. Now how? Why? 
And what they were finding, what they eventually found out, was that when you run a current into the wire, say you generated on an analog way, not a digital way, the electrons might move towards one end of the positive at one stage. Say this end becomes positive, and then when you, if you switched it over, so you're doing this generated wave, of course you're generating alternating current, as you went from one side to the other, the electrons would move as each side became uh, different in the position for the electronics. Right? So the, the electrons inside the wire were moving. And as they were moving, they were generating a pulse. So now, if you had another wire somewhere else, and the wave that came from that would then move the electrons in a similar way up and down in the wire. This becomes um, an aerial and antenna and a receiver, um, broadcasting antenna, and a receiving aerial. So, let's go back to something else. Problem is that you need a lot of energy to get this wave to carry of any distance that's worthwhile. When it arrives, the movement of the electrons in here has been dissipated because the wave generated has also been dissipated as it generates out. So the electrons are only moving really, really small distances. And the further you go, you can see the propagation of the wave decreases the energy. So there's a limit to this. You've got two choices. You either generate a really, really large wave to begin with, or you move everything close together. And if you move everything close together and you have repeater stations, then you're really developing technology, extra stuff that you don't want. Right? You might as well connect it with the cable because you're close enough, exactly. So, what's the problem? What, how do we solve the problem? Well, one of the things that they had to come up with was a way of amplifying the signal. Now, there is something we know of that you used last year when we talked about electronic components. Does anybody remember which one was the amplifying component? You had components that would only allow current to flow in one direction. You had amplifying components. You had storage components. Yeah, one of them's called a diode. Which one's which? All right, so this is a little bit of review then. You need to know these. You just had them. You don't need to know them exactly, like what, what values they are or what. You had resistors, diodes, capacitors, transistors, amplifiers. We're in which one of those? All right. The symbol for it looked a little bit like this. and you had a plate. You had a collector, a collector and an emitter, and you had a base. And the idea was that when this little gate here was open, nothing would take place. But if you had, if you had a charge, like you had a lot of a positive area and a negative area that could move the electrons from one to the other, they wouldn't move until that gate was open. And what you could do was you could apply a small force, small force to that, which would close the gate. This could be really large in storage, if you like, huge. And that would then allow, say, you only had a small charge here and a large stored charge, which could then flow through the wire. And every time the gate was opened and closed, that would open and close the larger flow. So. You, you go from a small value to a large value by storing the large value and only using it when you need it. That is a transistor, and that is why it's used as an amplifier. Now, that meant that I could start to go back to my problem of wire, distance from one, signal coming out, getting weaker, getting weaker, getting weaker, moving the electrons up and down as in induced movement, having a wire attached that allows me to see that voltage going up and down, send that off to a starting point, like a, this is a simplification, oversimplification, but what that will do then, and if you have a larger circuit with more value in here, more current in there, then you can drive something like a speaker with a switch going on and off. So you can hear click, click, click. 
So now I have something that can generate a decent sort of pulse that can be amplified at the other end and I will hear a pulse coming out. And so that's pretty much what Marconi recognized you could do. And so he started setting these experiments up and in 1896 he did a broadcast that was considered one of the first radio broadcasts. It was only done as a telegraph signal, so it was only pulses at that stage. My, uh, by that time Samuel Morse's Morse code was very well understood and, and, and well at least accepted, generalized. And one of the first places that this got used was where you would logically think you need it because you can't put wires there anyway. Where would that be? There's a phrase that often, often hear in old radio stations to all parts of the corners of the world and all the ships at sea. Ships at sea, all the ships at sea. It's very difficult to hold a wire around or keep dragging a wire around or pick up signals. With, if you're on land, you lay a, lay a cable, it's not a problem. But if you're out at sea, it's more difficult. So the first places that were really interested in doing this were Navy, and that's logical. There's a story that goes, well, a story, it's, it's pretty well regarded that um, when um, they started doing this in merchant marine telegraph, that's using a, a radio on a ship to broadcast back to land and get messages from the ships, one of the first times that the SOS signal was used. Anybody know? Right, the sinking of the Titanic. Apparently the radio operator only just received information about the standardized new broadcast and the standardized news bro new broadcast was SOS. And they actually think that maybe one of the reasons why two of the ships that were very close at the time didn't respond was that they weren't up to speed with the new signal. And there was a radio operator on a ship close by who heard the signal and was able to come across and they, they think over 700 lives may have been saved just on that because that ship was able to pick those people up. And he wouldn't have done it if he didn't know what SOS meant. Um, so that's, if that story is true, it's a great story, but yeah. yeah. Sometimes with these things, they get a little bit of urban legend going on, but it, it sounds cool. Okay, so we get to a place at the turn of the century, this is the 1900s, the a change from 1800 into the, two, the 20s, the 1900s rather, and um, you start thinking, well, can we do this with, with voice? Now, what's, what was the issue I talked about with... Um, Alexander Bell's idea of the telephone. What, how did that work again? What was the concept that he used? Using the, um, the speaker would, right. move, the, would move a diaphragm which induced a current with a magnet. Yep. And then that could be reversed at the other end to produce sound. Yeah, so how, how exactly that might work. So say it's a speaker, it could also be a microphone. So it could bring sound out or you could use it to send sound in. And the diaphragm in here had a little magnet sitting in the middle of the diaphragm. And the magnet was inside a coil of wire or inside a magnetic field if it was going the other way. And when the magnet, when the diaphragm moved backwards and forwards, the magnet would move inside the coil and induce movement. So that then could be bled off and that would give you a wave and that wave would vary depending upon how the speech was. So that would be an indication of the current being induced, going up and down in an analog way. Now if you're sending a signal which is a pulse, 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 that's just switching it on, switching it off, switching it on, switching it off, switching it on, switching it off, so on. You don't get a really neat wave thing. It's just either on or off, on or off, on or off. So how do we send that now there's two problems. One is that when we do this, what's generated is a very, very low volume, low amount of current. Now we could amplify that current out, but then we've got to be able to identify that movement in amongst all the other things that are being sent. And so the next thing they had to come up with was the idea of generating a known wavelength. Now there's two ways you can identify waves, and we'll do some more on this later. Waves work two ways. They go higher, or they may be, let's, see, let's change the color over so we can do this really cool, slightly lower. And if I put a point through there, the time it takes to go from this point to this point, 
and they're similar all the way in this sine wave form is the only thing that's changing here is the size of the wave and it's the size when it's down to the negative side the side when it's to the positive side so this one here maybe that's twice the height has double the amplitude the size now the other way we can change the wave is to go with one wave more often and with the other wave same size but less often so the this time the amplitude stays the same the size of the wave but what has varied now is the things between the same places on the wave now the same place on the wave when it repeats and comes back to that same position think about that circle we saw a minute ago where it goes up and around and as it goes around the wave comes out that particular time frame there over which that takes place is the frequency so how many how frequent do you return to the center point or how many how frequently do you arrive at the same place on the wave so now you've got two ways of creating or at least identifying differences in waves just a standard similar sine wave by amplitude or by how many times it goes past you at the same place or the same point occurs in a time frame frequency that still doesn't help us when you've got a weird sort of line that's all over the place how do you know what to tune to well you don't with that because it's all over the place so here's what you do you decide on a particular wave that you want to generate that everybody knows is coming now you can do this by setting an amplitude or you can do it by setting a frequency let's do the simple one with the amplitude so now you know that you are trying to tune for a movement that is that on the frequent the movement in the wire is of that type so you tune to it then you place this wave on top of that so you bring the two waves together and you add them together so wherever this is high or a certain height that gets let's put the center line in that little bit there that frequent that amplitude will be added to the amplitude of the wave that's already there does that make sense so what will finish up that wave will go up now at points where that wave is down low that could actually subtract so you'll get a change in the wave based on the two being added together one layered over the other okay the wave that you tune to is known as the carrier wave what you then do is the other end you generate a reverse wave now how do you generate a reverse wave you put it 90 degrees out of phase yes exactly so if I want to get rid of that wave I'm tuning to it but now I've got this gobbledygook which is mixed to between the two waves put in a wave that is or generate a wave that is one cycle half cycle out of phase okay now you've got this one that's the additive wave you've got the value of that one plus that one now you're taking the value of that one away and the value of that because you've cancelled it which leaves you back now to this one does that make sense all right good because that's we'll come back to this later we'll do some examples of that so the carrier wave gets cancelled at the receiver leaving behind the wave that's got the information in it now why do you do that because i can generate a more powerful carrier wave and carry into that a smaller frequency or smaller amplitude wave or a wave that doesn't have as much energy because I'm speaking into a microphone and then I can amplify that signal at the other end and I can receive it and hear it that's exactly what happened with voice radio so it doesn't take too long for them to develop the technology to do that so whilst they were doing these sorts of things just sending pulses at the beginning with Marconi within 10 years in fact there was a voice broadcast about four years after Marconi's one but within 10 years voice broadcasting was starting to rival this is radio or wireless as it was called then later to be adapted as radio from Mercedes' term 
um, as part of the, the, the main go-tos. Now, of course, why is voice radio better than sending Morse code? More information. Not more information. Less decoding. Less decoding. Everybody can understand what's being broadcast. You have to be trained to receive Morse, and the coder, the speed with which the coder does it, can make a difference to how fast the information comes across. But voice is immediate. So instead of having to translate what SOS was, so the Titanic perhaps, had it been a voice broadcast rather than a telegraph broadcast, then the other two ships might have said, oh, there's a problem over here, we better go and more people might have got saved, if that's the story. All right. By the 1920s, the um, availability of new types of transistors and amplifying systems, particularly out of vacuum valves that were coming out. Vacuum valves were acting as a, trans, uh, a transistor in, in systems and it made it easy for them to make, and because they're just glass tubes with air evacuated from it and a heat generated plate, it's really quite cheap. And so that was the next thing. How do you make your components cheaply and once they started manufacturing them in on mass, then wirelesses and radios became cheap enough for average people to get hold of. By the 1920s and 30s, most houses in most Western countries, particularly you know from America and things like this, were listening to radio broadcasts. Now, the first two or three things that radio broadcasts were done for, what do you think they might have been? Okay, news was not necessarily the first thing, actually. Although news broadcasting would become important, of course it would. All right, most people tuned into the radio to be entertained or to listen to sport. And, and there's a classic, apparently, that um, Americans are really cool and big on their uh, college football. And one of the first broadcasts in America was a college football game. And apparently they had an audience, a, a huge audience for this particular thing. Uh, by the 1930s and 40s, there were so many wirelesses and radios around, they were putting them in the motor cars because they could get them to be stationary and all get them to work as a, in a non-stationary environment. And there's a classic story from, from the 30s. This was just leading up to World War II and um, they were very nervous in America uh, about things like uh, uh, what, what could happen with the new technologies and things like this. And um, the couple of books have been written on science fiction things that were a bit scary and such. And one of the books that was written way back in the 1880s or 1890s by H.G. Wells was called uh, War of the Worlds. And a gentleman named Orson Wells, who was a uh, broadcasting uh, genius, really, a playwright and genius, he um, put together a screenplay for a fictional version of War of the Worlds. And he broadcast it. But he didn't tell any, well, there was a disclaimer at the beginning apparently, but he didn't tell anybody regularly throughout the broadcast that it was all complete fabrication. And it caused a stir because the uh, people who were listening to this actually thought they were listening to an invasion from Mars, that some flying saucers had landed outside the city of New York and and that there were people being attacked. And he, had it, he did it so well, apparently, that people were actually scared, locking doors. People, some people apparently got so scared they were willing to go and jump off cliffs and things like this, because it was very scary. So, yeah, it's worth looking up. It's, uh, he got into a lot of trouble for it, but it, it, it demonstrated how much people had become absolutely reliant on, on radio. And, what, and, and radio was their world. And so here's this guy comes along and convinces them that the, the world was coming to an end because they'd been invaded from Mars. Not that you know, anybody who was well read would probably think it's just a story, but apparently oh, it scared people. Okay, so what do you think the next big thing might be that we have to look at? Radio's now there and it's pretty entrenched and we still listen to radio. We will talk later about the difference between amplitude modulation and frequency modulation, AM and FM radio broadcasting. We'll also talk a little bit more about multiplexing and how you can get more information into a signal. Um, how might you do that by overlaying more than one signal into the carrier wave? Um, you can produce um, stereo and other things out of that by putting a left and right channel in. Um, so. We'll talk a bit more about that later. So what do you think we do next? 
what are you going to probably do when you get home this afternoon? Watch the television at some point, yeah. Now television doesn't come too far after. Because once you start realizing you're sending information, that's all you're really doing. If you can work out a way to capture an image, translate it into information, and then send that information wirelessly, or even down a wire if you had to, but wirelessly, then that information can be then decoded at the other end and turned back into the image. Now, how much you do that? Well, the next thing you have to come up with is a way of recording a scene electronically. Now, at first, it seems a little like a really difficult proposition, um, but it isn't really. If you were to register the amount, of, the amount of light coming from a particular object, whether it's really bright or really dark, and you had a, uh, a photoelectric cell that was reading the input of the, of, of the photons as they hit, they would be hit with larger energy from a white area and no energy from a black area because there's nothing coming back. So in a very simple way, black and white, you can broadcast black and white by having uh, a surface that would be hit by photons that allow you to then take a reading from that position and send that signal away. So that photo responsive area is what you need to have, and that's not hard to come up with either. Our eyes are basically that. At the back of our eyes, we've got photoreceptors. Those photoreceptors, when they get hit by the photons, they generate a small electronic pulse. That electronic pulse goes down the optic nerve, the brain registers it, and we paint a picture. So effectively, all they were doing was creating a mechanical version, an electronically mechanical version, of what our eyes do. You use a lens, you use a capture device, you concentrate the light down on the, on the surface, you take the information away from the back of this, and you go somewhere and produce it. Now, that's what you have to come up with. You have to have some way of producing the image. What they did to do that was that they created a vacuum tube. Ooh, nice colour. Let's get rid of that. Might not be seen on the screen. A tube of glass onto the surface, inside of the surface of the tube, they would put a material that would respond to being hit by an electron beam, that would fluoresce, glow. And then, using a magnet system at the back, generate photons that would fly into a magnetic field, and the magnetic field would change and direct the photons to hit the phosphorescence, which would then glow. And you can target it by going, if we look at the screen straight on, you can go across the screen. So you target your electron beam across the screen, then you come back and you go down, and you come across and you go down, and you keep doing this zigzag pattern of the electrons, and you turn them on and off when you want them to be bright, so white, and when you want it to be black. And you paint basically a picture in black and white dots. Now, the number of dots is going to determine how good the, um, the image is. So that's the resolution. The number of times you go through the rastering, this is the term for this, one of the lines, that will, t that will give the clarity of how the picture moves, if you like. So um, if you're just doing something like uh, simple cross or something then it's not moving you don't really need to go fast because it's going to paint the picture and the phosphorescence will stay there for a while but if you want to do moving images you have to get this to move fast enough through the cycling to convince your eyes that it's actually a full-on picture but be fast enough so you don't see the movement of the electrons right basically that's what the solve that the problem had to be solved once you get that particular problem solved and they did obviously you now have a means of taking from the lens that you have in your camera. So you've got your camera looking out here at an image. It's being picked up on the photoresponsive cells at the back, all being registered as a position on the grid. So that, that image is coming in. So the image is a house, right, a house out here. The image comes in, it then gets sent, can be sent by a wire or sent wirelessly. Receivers decode it. You send it out and you get the picture painted on here of a house. Now that might sound like it's an extremely difficult proposition to do and it does take time to develop, 
mid-30s, uh, the fellow that uh, we um, have the Logies named after is uh, Logie Bear. Logie, <laughs> not Yogi Bear. Logies are named after the guy who's come up with this system, or at least part of that system, because there's a lot of other developments go into it as well. But bottom line is that we now start looking at television. First, very fuzzy, black and white only. How do you do colour? Colour's not much more difficult because our eyes do colour the same way. We have rods in the back of our eyes that receive blue, red and so on, that are the three colours, and the collective colours. We can separate those in a filtering process and re-add them together at the end of this. So you get the RGB, red, blue, green, blue uh, additive colours and they come out as a colour TV set. All right. So very, why do you think colour TV or at least TV itself would be more popular than radio? You can see it, yes. So now not only do you have spoken word instead of a coded message, you now can see things taking place. And we've got the world around us now with those things involved. All right, one final point in this, this wind up or this introduction. So these are just showing how telecommunications has evolved. We need to think seriously about how it changes the world. So we'll have a conversation about that in a moment. But I just wanna, um, I, I once heard some guy, a radio uh, scientist guy talking about, uh, he was asking, uh, it was ABC series and they were asking, what were the seven greatest inventions of all time? And they got these major scientists to do this. And what would you consider the seven major you know, writing, uh, the wheel thingy? Um, but one of the guys said the telephone system. And then he went on to explain how that was intriguing to him. And it is quite remarkable. And just to give you an indication of why it's remarkable, even if you just use the old landline system, just, just go back to when people actually had phones with cables attached. Uh, some houses still do have them, most people are going wirelessly anyway. But just take away the first thing. So first thing you do is you've got somebody with a phone, picks up the phone. Picking up the phone then closes a circuit which allows the circuitry to say, okay, you're getting ready to send a message. You send the message generally by pressing buttons used to be different, it used to be on a dial thing, but we changed that over time into um, sending pulses in audio pulses down the line, because uh, it was less likely to be interfered with and more accurate, and you could put more pulses into it, so, and it took less time to do. So a message gets sent down the wire. Now where does it go? What it does is it goes probably only about three k's. Most of the first part of the system is only about three k's long. So it closes this circuit with a thing which is not, we call it exchange. In other countries it's slightly called something else. Some of these things are those, you see them on the side of the road, there's um, big gray looking cylinders that sometimes you see the guy working on and it's got all those lines and so it comes into that routering exchange. That then sends a message off to a larger exchange, which will then probably send to a major hub. We've got a major hub in Nara. That the major hub then decides, well, what kind of a call is this? What, where is it going? So it looks first at the first couple of digits to see what the area code is. Now, if the area code remains like Australia, 02, for example, it then decides to reroute this by a landline to a, an exchange closer to where the next set of numbers are. So, you know, four fours or two twos or wherever it is. So it says Queensland or uh, New South Wales or so on. So that would go, say, perhaps to Sydney. And from there, that particular router goes and finds another exchange, a local, local, local exchange, um, central exchange, and then goes to a, another local exchange, which will find from that same signal, it'll go and say, okay, well, of all the lines I've got, the numbers on the code say that I want to go to this particular number. It goes to that little pole thing again, and that's directed out to someone else's house where that number is attached, and their phone rings. Now that's remarkable just in itself. But what if you want to say, call England? All right, so it gets to the central exchange, like the narrow exchange, and the coding is now for overseas. So now it doesn't send it to the local exchanges along the landlines in, in the, the national landlines, it will send it to the late major um, uh, satellite broadcasting 
towers. And there, there was, there used to be one at the back of uh, Prospect. Um, they're around all over the place in, in, in Australia. There's three or four of them around in Sydney. And when it gets to that, it goes to the exchange there, which has got, it could be that it actually was going to do it over wireless. And they used to do that too, so it'd send a signal over wireless rather than wire formed. So it could have an aerial attached and be pulsing that out. Or it could now have a microwave link sending it up to a satellite. So a signal is sent to the satellite. Now, let's say we're calling, say, England. You know, someone in England. There's Norway, all right, and the French. Let's say Scotland's up here somewhere, all right? And you want to ring someone in London. So this whole thing is repeated in London, only it's reversed. So they've got their version of a tower and the satellite, because it's above the horizon, connects to a satellite that's further around the, the radius of the Earth until it can get a line down to the ground. It sends a signal down. It connects then to the major exchange. It then works out where the local exchange is. That works out where the corner broadcast is. Now, these are towers now these days mostly. Right? So the towers that are around for wireless broadcasts, so these little local things that aren't wired to the house tend to be a tower somewhere local. So you just exchange that for a cell system. And that then rings a phone in the house in London. Now, when this guy was explaining this, you sit there and he says, this, this is a miracle. This is a remarkable achievement. Not because there's about 500 places where it could all go wrong, but it still works. But it happens in a fraction of a second. By the time you've said to sort of press the buttons, you only have to wait a few moments and the phone in England will ring and someone can pick it up. Now, they're going to be really annoyed at you because it's three o'clock here in the afternoon and it's middle of the night there, but that's okay. You're waking them up anyway, so that's fine. But that system is quite remarkable. Just replace that and that with a tower, and now you've got a mobile, and we'll talk later about cell systems and how that came out of the American idea of moving between sections, um, and now we're all wirelessing up things. All right, anyway, so keep that in mind. Now, how does that change people's lives? Absolutely, the contact, the freedom of contact, and you don't, you, you suddenly don't feel as far away from people. We are speaking quite open all the time with people on the other side of the planet. You're doing it when you do the internet. Now, the internet is built onto the framework that's already there from this stuff. Um, it's more complicated than that. Well, it's more complicated. It's just a different way of doing the same idea. The satellites are still in play. You still use the landline things. The really cool thing with the the internet one is that the information is packaged in little bundles and so if i'm here in australia and i want to send a signal over to the us all right i might find that that signal might go let's say here's new zealand it's packaged and broken up into little components that can be sent, little pieces of information, packaging, uh, little packets. And the decision might be that on all the telephone lines that we've got, when there's nothing happening on one particular line, they say, oh, let's send a few packets down that line. So that might send one over here. So packet number one might go to New Zealand and then say sent to Hawaii, and that gets over to Chicago. Maybe say, say I want to ring someone in, or send a, a, a message by the internet to someone in New York. And it might go up to, um, say, uh, not that San Francisco, somewhere up there, and then shoot across to Chicago, and then down to New York. So it hits about five different places. But it might also work out that the next package, it's actually quicker to send it, in this time, the phone line's open, send it to Perth, um, up to Indonesia, then across to, say, um, China or Japan, and then goes across to Alaska, and then down to San Francisco and pick it up. <laughs> this, this is where it gets really freaky, is that the packages can go in all different directions, just going wherever the, the line is open and free, and the quickest route 
for that particular information. And the packages might arrive all out of sync because the first package might have gone, or the, sec the second package might go a faster route than the first package and arrive before it. And so what the m computer does at the end is it reassembles all the little packages and puts them in order and then opens them up and reads the information. And it does all of that in fractions of a second. And not just little packets of one or two letters, whole photographs, whole pictures, whole video images, all that is being sent around in these tiny little bundles. It's quite remarkable, the technology involved in it. I don't pretend to understand it. I just know it's, because I know enough about it to see it like that, I go, this is really quite remarkable. So when that guy said, what's the most amazing thing that we've ever done? It wasn't invent the wheel, it wasn't invent fire or anything. He said, basically it's to, to be uh, able to communicate the way we do, just using basic electronics. It's very, very cool. Okay, so last five seconds, what are major, major changes? What would you, obviously, no one feels alone. What other areas of life do you think have changed as a result of being able to be aware so readily? World events. World events, absolutely. You don't have to wait weeks to find out what's going on on the other side of the planet. We know immediately. I mean, that shooting that just happened in Orlando, people were waking up to that information pretty much within hours of it taking place, if not moments afterwards. If you were that ready to inf have information streamed to you, it would probably come up on, as one of your messages if you have a an, um, part of your internet or your um, phone system set up, send you breaking news if you really want to be involved. Okay, so we're, we're more informed, if you like, and rapidly informed. Certainly things like sports and stuff have changed in that regard because we, we don't have to wait now to find out the results of the cricket matches being played on the other side of the planet or we can watch it live and three in the <laughs> if you really want to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So what else might? There's other areas as well, not just entertainment. Obviously entertainment's a biggie for us because we're swamped with that. That's what we do. All right, so definitely with the internet and that system, the internet was partly developed out of military need, uh, coming out of the Cold War, um, the recognition that if you had all your um, response to an attack centralised, then basically that centralised position becomes a target. So let's distribute the response to all different places so that if you wanted to do a first attack, you'd have to get everybody. Um, you'd knock that one off and another one would take over the response. That was partly the concept. Yep. So there were the idea of being able to be uh, with the satellites and stuff, certainly in military stuff, knowing where people are. And also organising stuff and, it, and, and um, if something goes wrong, being able to fix it straight away while everyone knowing exactly what's happening. True, yep, yep. So response times in situations. Yeah. Okay, let's take that one for example. What about emergency situations? <laughs> well, the, yeah, I'm thinking more in terms of the good things going on, maybe not the negative things. Let's say for example, I uh, have a car accident on the way home this afternoon, um, but I'm incapacitated by the car accident, but two people driving past have mobile phones. They don't stop and take photographs. Yeah, they <laughs> may, but hopefully they'll, they'll call for help, right? So they'll call for help and an ambulance will be dispatched. Most of this being done wirelessly. And if, if it all goes well, then I might receive immediate care in a, in a situation like that within half an hour, perhaps. You know, it's, it's, certainly it's a good system. Yeah, it's more the speed of how the vehicle can get to you yeah, and that's right. how someone can contact them. That's, that's definitely right. It's not, the restriction on that one is how far away I am from the ambulance at the time they received the call and what the road might be like on the way to it. But even that, when the ambulance was to arrive, they can start using electronic data to send that back to hospitals to get information ready for it. So in emergency situations now, and that's not just on a personal level, it can be on a national level, it could be uh, fires, communi communication with, when we have bushfires and um, how we coordinate responses to floods. Um, so there's a whole bunch of uh, really beneficial things that come out of being able to communicate rapidly. Uh, and without a while, wireless, uh, without a phone you have to run to and put two, 20 cents in to get a call, 
I mean, you don't have a pocket full of coins, you can't call anybody, you know, that sort of thing. So you've got, yes, socialization. Sometimes you could argue that it's actually reducing the socialization because we tend to spend too much time on the entertainment element or on the mindless socialization stuff that goes on, um, Facebooking and such, and letting everybody see my latest uh, uh, selfie. I, I heard something the other day which was a bit frightening that for you younger people, and I say that with, you know, I feel young still, but for you younger people, and I do use a mobile phone, so I'm trendy, um, I'm keeping up with the Joneses, um, that you've taken so many selfies that when people look at your record of photographing, you've got something like 75% of your photographs include you in them. So that's a bit of a worry. So you, you might be out having a look at a brilliant sunset and actually, I, this happened to us when I was traveling. We went to New Zealand and we went and saw a place where there was a geyser that was going to erupt. And the guy was making it erupt by throwing soap into it, which was a bit tricky and, you know, a bit not natural. But anyway, I'm sitting there waiting for this thing to happen. So, and as soon as it started to go off, all the people under 30 and particularly those of slightly Asian appearance would run down and they'd stand in front of it, turn around and get, get the selfie stick out. And so they weren't even looking at the geyser. They were taking a photograph of themselves. Anyway, just weird. It just looks strange with all these people. <laughs> I'm looking at the thing and they're all looking at me, but they're not looking at me. They're looking at their camera looking at the thing. Um, yeah, it was just bizarre. So, yeah, so 75%, eh? You better check your photos and see how many you... That's a, that's a massive amount. All right, so communication for emergency services rather than just socialising. Um, News, um, bringing people together, um, communicating on a level that we have never had before. Now, what are the downsides to all of that? Well, obviously I said one might be that we don't actually talk to each other. You know, that thing I said yesterday about the program in Britain, the look up, you know, stop paying attention to this thing and start having a conversation with people, you know. Um, negatives? Demographic to ask negatives. Oh, okay, the wrong, wrong de demographic to ask negatives about social media, all right. Yeah, well, look, you open yourselves up, or open, everybody seems to open themselves up to abuses. Um, you you uh, bring, if we start to use our telecommunication systems more and more for finance then, uh, and for transactions and doing that sort of thing, then there's a vulnerability there. Now you might say, well, hang on, when there was money and people used to go to the bank, you could still get ripped off because you just get bashed over the back of the head and they take your money. It's probably better if they take the money without hitting you. Um, you know, so that, you know, it's, it, crimes are still crimes no matter where they, and they, everybody's been, been doing crime for ages. But the vulnerability systems are there too. And of course, we invent whole systems to protect ourselves from that. So we have all these security systems now and passwords and um, and then they build systems to counteract the system. Yeah, okay, build systems to counteract the systems, yeah. So th it's not all great, but in the main, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, you, you, you're living in a time when writing a letter doesn't... You, 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 what? Who writes letters? Letters are written and cards are sent for special occasions only, and it shows that you are taking the time to do that. You know, you get a letter from your grandmother on your birthday uh, or a, a card with a special message in it and a $20 note. Is $20 still enough? No, 50s now, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Depends how much they love you. Ah, depends <laughs> on how much they love you. Yes, fair enough. So, yeah. All right, well, you've got to keep in mind all of those social impacts along with the technological impacts. Um, and they, they, I think the text that we have lists are quite a few of them. Um, so just be familiar with them and be able to argue in a question what are some of the pluses and some of the minuses that came about as a result of the information revolution and the technological advances in telecommunications. All right. What about the future? What do you think is going to happen? Holographic. Oh, holographics, yeah, yeah. possibly. Yeah. Actually, Using yeah. lasers yeah. more often and so Talking optical fibers, more information being sent, yeah. I've, I've seen images of, of um, a classroom that uh, was, 
basically what happened was the screen has um, a picture on it of another classroom and this particular other classroom happened to be in I think it was India I think it was the one and this class was conducting conversations and the students in one classroom were talking to the students in the other via the board and writing on the board and the board was translating between the two languages and you know, sort of that sort of thing and, and taking it for granted like you take for granted now the fact that I can do I do that I can go and there's all this stuff up on the board so that's you know future generations I'm actually going to give you send, send you some um, links to a number of YouTubes uh, YouTube videos one on the physics section about how waves work because he's going to we come back to that um, another one which is a bit longer and a bit obtuse because it's it's not really on topic but you, if you stick with it it's it's not too bad and that's on uh, a futurist talking about the potential for the future of, of um, telecommunication systems uh, another one which is just for fun of a guy, a guy climbing the tallest telecommunications tower in the world um, and finally another group of ones from a guy who's from America talking about how their phone system developed over time and he has some cool things to show you about um, old-fashioned phones and how the old-fashioned phones work and how we get phrases like uh, hang up the phone you know. anyway I'll send those all to you all and just take some time to have a look at them largely only five minutes long all right that's it for the day